Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I'm your host, Diane Gibbs, and this is episode 369. And I'm here with my friend, Will Hardaway, back again to talk about um, racism, equity, and uh, we're going to get into some specifics. On We started a conversation back in November, and Will and I, we talk almost every week, so we it wasn't like we stopped our conversation and haven't really finished <laughs> anything, but... Um, I, I wanted to make sure that this was usually I do my part twos for patrons. And so I just wanted this one to be back. And this week is we start the month. Uh, I know last month I made it up. It wasn't like the national mental health awareness month or anything like that. It was just mental health, mental health awareness, I guess on design recharge. And then this month is all about loving on and lifting on lifting up other creatives. So I hope you guys will join me for Love on Designers all month. And this week is focused on um, energizing someone. So used to in pre-COVID, we would maybe buy each other coffee or take somebody to lunch or something like that. Now we can't do that so much, but hopefully you can find something else and other ways to energize. But one of the things I do to energize is I have conversations like this because I'm an extrovert and so, and I love to learn. So I use this time. So my after lunch time to get energized by hanging out with you guys. And so Will is back on just in case, Will, they weren't here for the first one. Um, can you just remind people a little bit about your background and how long you've been doing workshops and the consulting in inclusivity and um, diversity work? My name is Will Hardaway. I'm originally from uh, Texas. I I was born kind of a street kid. I didn't have any thoughts about going to college, but I ended up in college. And uh, there I, I majored in philosophy as an undergrad. And so that kind of introduced me to just thinking and reasoning and, and critical thinking. And uh, I always had uh, an interest in like art, design, creativity, imagination, that kind of thing. And so I ended up studying for my master's. I studied uh, design thinking as a tool uh, for social justice. And um, all the while doing that, um, I also uh, worked, um, well, I still work with uh, the National Coalition Building Institute which is an organization that um, focuses on prejudice reduction uh, and welcoming diversity, as well as affinity um, as a practice and affinity, if you all know what that, that means. Mean? That means like, um, you know, so uh, we have, there's a lot of different affinity groups. So there's a, a, a black affinity group and that gives you a space and, and companies are starting to do this. Um, it gives you a space to talk with people you identify with. Um, there's uh, white, white, uh, white identity affinity groups because that's, you know, as a power group, um, oftentimes you have the privilege of not talking about race and some of these issues. And so you might find affinity in a group where you can have open conversations about difficult to discuss things. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of companies are starting to do this. Uh, Nike, Adidas, you know, are starting to do this because they realize that no matter how welcoming or team or culture driven they are, um, there's always this element of racism and prejudice and unconscious bias that's impacting employees. Yeah. Okay. So then how long have you been doing this? So like, when did you get your master's? And then just to kind of give, give them a little bit of a framework. So I've been facilitating those types of workshops for about a decade. Um, and also for about a decade, but separately, I've been uh, facilitating design thinking workshops. And so uh, last year I got the bright idea to kind of really drive change by intersecting both of those things. Because oftentimes when I conduct welcome and diversity workshops, people will come up um, to me like later uh, down the line, like a month from when they participate or a couple of weeks and they'll say, you know, my eyes are open, I'm more aware, I'm more alert, but I feel powerless when I hear hear things or when I see mm. things. And at my workplace, we're not doing these uh, these things that I think we should be doing, but I don't know 
how to have a voice. And, and when I do have a voice, I kind of get shut down. And so intersecting design thinking and anti-racism work, my, my objective is to basically create solutions, help people get to decisions faster about race, which is something that folks find difficult to talk about. I find I love talking about it and discussing it with people that don't feel comfortable doing so because oftentimes I find that th that's the first conversation they had about it with someone. Mm, that's really good. I do. I think that it is, it can be touchy and people don't want to be offensive, but I think there's a lot of questions and, and I think that it, we have to have a safe place to do that. So that's why maybe a workshop is good because they can, they can go in and they can consume, but then mm -hmm. it's also, you can create right. a place that's safe for people to be able to share or ask questions. I know that I've asked right. questions and I feel comfortable. I don't feel like you're judging me. Um, but I think that that's part of part of your superpowers that you're able to um, help people not feel um, intimidated. Right. Okay. So we started talking um, about a couple things and there were a couple things that hit. And so, uh, but we really didn't get to cover any of the questions that I had before. Um, and I think I added one of these, I might've added it in a, in something else. I don't know if I added it here, but I remember uh, we talked. And so it's not on the sheet. I'm going off the sheet. If you don't remember the same, hey, don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, and it was about cultural appropriation. And so I was like, yeah. I am so confused on this. I don't know. And then I'm like, okay, is it bad? Is it, is it, how do you do this? Or how do you not do this? So can you mm. just explain it, what that means? And then um, your take on whether that is or how we can handle that. Cause it does mm. happen a lot in fashion. Right. Right. And Matthew right. already said he loved your, all the art behind you. So do you want to tell him who, cause you, you had somebody encourage oh, you all to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a virtual, <laughs> it's a virtual background. Um, this is John Michel Basquiat. He was a prominent black artist in New York uh, that, was connected with uh, Andy Warhol at some point and they worked together, but, you know, just um, a lot of commentary on systems and uh, institutions. Um, like if you like starting with graffiti tags and then kind of evolving to canvas. And um, he was one of these types of artists that painted on anything, but everything that he painted had a meaning uh, was connected to black culture strongly. Um, and his paintings are going for some, some some war bucks right now yeah okay so then let's just talk about that in in art or even mm -hmm. in design so that could be cultural appropriation too so that's more in the design industry not necessarily fashion but how so kind of making it um so that it's understand we understand what bucket we're playing in because people right. do do that they like see it and they're like oh my gosh that's cool i basky i use that i'm gonna do that so right. what is so is that what cultural or is that just like ripping off an artist? Appropriation is interesting. I think it's best understood when you think about um, October around every year, Halloween. Mm. If your son um, wanted to be Black Panther and he got the Black Panther costume, that is showing his love for Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Now, if your son wanted to paint his face black or start to act uh, in stereotypical ways that like a, a black person or an African person would behave, that's appropriation. So, um, and that's where it gets tricky. And, and a lot of this has to do with not listening to one another. So appropriation, the reason why it consistently happens is because the person with good intentions, bad intentions, whatever, they're not the, they're not the person that dictates whether something's offensive or not. So who gets to, de who decides just each individual person? The person that's hurt. Yeah. So it's the person that's hurt. And so where the dialogue shuts down at is, um, you know, if somebody was unaware of like, hey, you know, putting on these uh, on these costumes or or painting in that way has some pain connected to it. If they were not aware of that and it happens, 
the first instinct is like defensiveness or attacking. Um, and that's kind of where the dialogue shuts down. And that's when it becomes political because appropriation is not inherently a political type of issue. It's an issue of um, intention and pain. So whether you intended to or not, you heard me. And so what do we do with that pain? Mm -hmm. Will you hurt me again? Do you have any regrets for hurting me? Do you know why you hurt me? Mm. And so instead of diving into and exploring and listening to the pain, we will often kind of go to our corner and say, here we go again. Here we go again with this appropriation mm. stuff. You know what I mean? And, and each case is going to be different because um, people feel pain differently. But there, there are some things that you can learn from other folks that are having these conversations. It happens a lot in culture so uh, or in fashion. And I think about people like putting gauges in their ears, you know, like that's a definite um, like uh, that in Asian cultures, uh, gauges or like the neck rings, you know, that's uh, people do that. But then, you know, I have like Tibor Kalm and he has a, a book and it was just really images and it was like some it was like an old lady in America and she was like a crossing guard and she had a whole bunch in her little you know vest that's orange or whatever she had a whole bunch of like buttons all over it and then he pairs it with somebody from another culture and what they think is beautiful and he had like um just like uh his ears had had like uh cans like like mm -hmm. sardine cans or not sardine like but like salmon cans it, it was like you could still see the graphic and i think that was probably what probably maybe it was like changing out your earrings you know and so but then this now gauges is is done by lots of people that have no connection to that cultural um like rite of passage or or i'm not sure you know if it's just a beauty thing so I, and i am i feel stupid asking but i do feel like i can i can ask and you're not going to be like okay dummy diane you know so so what is is that cultural like when some if I had my gauge, I don't have gauges, but if I had, you know, that, is that me appropriating inappropriately? It, it, it honestly, it depends. Like what is the intention there? Um, what if I you, just like the aware? way it looks? Right. Okay. And so if you like the way it looks, um, you have to be cognizant of, and this goes for, um, and, you, and the reason why we hear this a lot in fashion and in entertainment, because then you get into you're profiting, you're benefiting mm. from something that. Um, so, like, let's say I'm I'm an actor and and I have, um, you know, for me, I'm I'm strongly connected to like the institution of slavery in the South, and so let's say. I come in and and I want to express myself and I, and I'm and I'm trying to connect to my African heritage and and I have jewelry. Where appropriation gets gets clearly more clearly defined that is that me as a black man I come into a workspace and I'm unprofessional. Oh. I you know like so me wearing that I'm getting all these consequences. And then what happens in entertainment and, fa and fashion is, oh, suddenly when, mm -hmm. when Kim Kardashian or anybody mm -hmm. else wants to braid their hair, suddenly it's accepted, it's applauded, you know. Mm -hmm. but so it's okay for some, but not okay for others. In terms of wearing, like wearing um, mm -hmm. cornrows, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. It's basically everybody has their own story and their own rationale, their own connections with people. So for an, a person every day, you're not likely to see a lot of conflict over it. But for a Kim Kardashian, it's kind of like all these black models have been told to straighten and yeah. do these things to their hair in order to make it. And they can't move up uh, through this glass ceiling without um, kind of uh, acquiescing to, to what's 
what's more the white ideal. But then when Kim does it, it's a fashion statement. So does Kim do it and it makes it OK for them uh, to uh, uh, like somebody who wasn't who would want to is is that is does that make it OK or does that just make it worse? Like the reason why it makes it worse is because that that stigma is different for black people mm. than for her. And so now it's like, OK, now this is accepted, but. I'm a model and I'm hired on the, the next week on a shoot and I want to wear a cornrows and you tell me, no, that's ghetto. Mm. And so that's where a lot of appropriation issues uh, kind of come up in our everyday dialogue. And sure, the, the crossing guard or, or the woman that's working uh, in your design agency or something, yes, that is offensive it is appropriation but we're probably not gonna hear a public conversation about it how do we avoid hurting people's feelings but also um so maybe these brands and again i'm thinking trying to figure out because i i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but i also it's like maybe the the consumers need to stand up uh, and say, you know, it, it, it's just like if people are, uh, they can either not support or to, to support if they knew that they weren't hired, they weren't, they were asking these um, uh, black models to straighten their hair, take their cornrows out or, or not have um, in their hair in a different way or whatever that, that it was because they uh, they weren't allowing them to just be authentically them. And that that was, I don't know what I'm asking. I'm well, I, you know, I, I like think how what can we do this. How can we as a consumer make a difference? Do you know right. what I mean? Right. And I think uh, some of that is happening. Some of that is happening when, you know, when, when a campaign is posted on social media and it's like, whoa, look at this, like, how did they not realize that? Um, so, you know, transparency, accountability, having the conversations, I think that will slowly make it happen. I do think the companies need to start to take some ownership of, of when they make those mistakes, not kind of, they need to realize that it's more beneficial to their brand to transparently have conversations about how those mistakes happen as opposed mm -hmm. to the old model of PR, let me sweep it under the rug right. and give you something shiny and new to pay attention to because the, the generations that are coming up, they um, like Gen Z, they specifically are more interested in authenticity of brands. So they want brands that um, they know where their materials source from. They know who, uh, what type of labor practices are going mm -hmm. on with factories that they have. They are aware of their bias and, and how racism is present in their business and they're working toward addressing it. And so um, a lot of that needs to happen internally within the companies to make a, a, a huge move and shift. But as a consumer and as an audience, we can hold them accountable. And, you know, uh, civil rights leaders gave us the blueprint if that's the way you're, you're going to hire people, Gucci, we will not be buying Gucci, you know, and we saw that happen a couple of summers ago. Yeah. So Amy says, yes, own up to the mistake and pledge to do better and then take action. So I think that that's mm -hmm. super important. So I'm going to go back a little bit. So you, uh, you said you kind of grew up uh, rough. I don't know how much you want to go in there to that. So I'm going to just let it be. But it was a different life. You thought that there was just one way out. You thought the stuff you saw on TV was like just TV land that people didn't. Yeah. I mean, granted, nobody lives like the Brady Bunch, you know, but <laughs> uh, but it was it wasn't as odd maybe to me growing up as it was to you. You just thought it was kind of fantasy, just like it was yeah. uh, Avatar was fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So just to kind of give everybody a uh, perspective. So you have always been a really um, good, open learner, I think, because for yeah. you to be able to accept that 
uh, that there could be something else when everybody else has told you that, no, that's just fantasy. So the one of the questions I had on the sheet from last time was, when you started spending time and living in different environment, because you moved from Texas right. to California with your sister, yeah. or, and you yeah. started living with your sister, um, what two things did you notice most about this new, because it was a different world? Me personally, I noticed that initially the number one thing was you got two things. One, I grew up in an environment where if my best friend and I, my cousins and I, we had an issue with one another, we physically fight. And then two, Southern people, and they've done studies on this, have a lot of pride. So I learned pretty quickly that fighting was not acceptable, <laughs> was just not, not an acceptable form of, of communication and dialogue. <laughs> um, Thankfully. And, and then I also noticed just the, the way people lived. I remember my sisters and brothers and I, um, you know, coming out to California. The first thing we said was like, where's the hood? Like where, where's like people that we can talk to that we can connect with. And, um, you know, living in a, a place where like that area was super nice like not didn't look at all third world didn't look at all familiar looked nice and just seeing people live a, a, a different way um and you start to ask questions like what do you do who are you you know a lot of people where i'm from like there's nursing homes there's um yeah the, the number one professions were like nursing homes and uh, meat packing plants and feed and feed plants or the drug game, which is what my family, um, which is what our profession was. So seeing people that are doing a bunch of different things, and I was recently on a panel giving a talk and, and somebody asked like, how can we um, you know, improve the graduation and retention of, of black students? And I was like, you know, when I was growing up, there were principals, there, there were probably lawyers in town. There were, you know, there were people that I, that I saw that had an education degree and all that, but they didn't come around. So the people that came around and showed like, let me, let me um, sit in the passenger side of this expensive car. Let me do this. Let me do that. We're dope dealers. And I was explaining on that panel, if a, if an engineer from the power company, who, if a person was like an electrical engineer or something, they come, they show me how they live and, and and how they how their life is that's going to be attractive to me so being in relationship you we need yeah. role models we need people that are gonna love on us that are right at different and the places. internet is helping the inter yeah. the internet is, is definitely helping like if i had as much access to to really get to deeply know people and even um connect with people uh yeah my my, my worldview would have been way more expanded hmm. okay so then so that was one thing and then it was just that you didn't know you didn't realize that because there you you noticed that there wasn't a place that you recognized physically yeah just um you know, and i and i always go back to i was working with this program called street saints and um, I remember talking to the coordinator um, when we got to, when we met up at this event that we were going to do. And um, he was like, you know, we're coming over um, the overpass, getting off the freeway. And, um, and this is in Fresno, California. And one of the kids says, this is in Fresno. And he was like, this is Fresno. And the kid was like, nah, this does not look like Fresno. And I think the way that reconstruction went down and how a lot of that, um, a lot of the progress for, were, was taken, we still feel the pain of that because ghettos were a design. And that's what I try to get people to understand. Racism was intentionally designed, like the, the same way that you would design an app or design um, a logo 
like all the meetings and iterations and, and ideas and critiques. And that is how racism was created. Unions were created to keep black people out of jobs. Tips were created to not pay black workers fair wages. Like everything people sat down and, and, and planned out. And so like that, ki that kid coming from West Fresno is like, this is not Fresno because I've lived 14, 15 years in the same area. I can't get out. There's a food desert. There's, um, you know, just uh, a desert of any type of opportunity. Can you imagine spending your life somewhere and there's a whole new world around you, but you can't get to it? Yeah, that's pretty powerful. And how do we, How? what would you think is the best way to, like that kid was driving around and somebody said, no, this is Fresno. So again, it's about relationships and investing in people, mm -hmm. right? Spending time yeah. with people. So how, what would you think is the best way for us to do that in, as when we're on social media or when, uh, just so that, because so, sometimes people have to get to know you before they DM you, right? right? Or they, before they get on a call or, or something like that. So especially maybe this is great with love on designers that where you also should reach out to somebody else who maybe you can energize. So somebody who right. you might see has, um, you know, sometimes they, we just need a, Oh, I didn't know that was, that was possible. Right. Uh, you, you know, I would say the way we tell one another, know your local politicians, mm -hmm. I would say know where the most impoverished areas mm -hmm. in your community are. Um, and find ways that you can connect with people in those areas so on an individual level. Do you think that sometimes those, the, I don't know uh, what um, it might be for other people, but sometimes I might be like apprehensive to go because I might mm. think that they would think that I wasn't being authentic. So I've even had people tell me that I work with and I was like, oh, I'm a team player. And they right. were like, yeah, nobody says that. You know, I'm like, yeah, but I <laughs> you, am. You got to you got to go and you got to listen. That that's a good point, Diane. What you what you said is a good point. Um, I, I often tell people if you're in an organization and you use the words we, us, the team, there's people in that organization that do not identify with that. And so every time you use that, you're talking about an in group that you might not, not even be aware of. Yeah. That there's this in group that's that's dominant, that's that's uh, powerful, and there's a group that's being marginalized in in the business. And so, what I you raised a good point. You wouldn't want to go off the bat and be like, "I'm here to save everybody." Right. You, know? you want to go. You want to listen. You want to learn, and you want to find an uh, an organic connection point if you can. Like, if you're a church going person, take a group of people and attend a black church. Mm -hmm. meet some people set it up with the pastor yeah so that's a great idea yeah. um okay so you have a keen ability to observe and listen and we've just talked about that listening um is super important and sometimes it's about letting people so let's say we're in a company or we are in we have um an agency and we do a lot of uh we hire a lot of contractors and, and we're really, or we're at a conference or whatever it is that our organization is, whether it's big or little. And you want to make sure that nobody is self-silencing. Can you explain what self-silencing is and why it happens and then how we might can um, combat that? Like you'll, you'll probably hear the term cold switching or frame switching when it comes to discussions about race, because in order for uh, people of color to advance, they have to mm -hmm. act professionally, objectively. And those are all kind of pre-written um, white ideals of what those things mean. And so tone changes and everything will orient toward how can I make um, white people feel more comfortable around me, have more confidence in me, not ignore me, not be scared of me. And so um, 
I'm always a proponent of it's on the institution, it's on the business, it's on the government, it's it's on the people doing harm to make the biggest change. And yeah, as as black people, we can we can find community with one another, we can bank black, we could support black businesses, we can be in black spaces. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to work in coalition with uh, people outside of our group. And in order for us to do that, people outside of our group need to realize um, the pain and suffering that's enacted every day in our, in, in our various spaces. So, so a, if a company was really wanted to work on that part of their culture or mm-hmm. they're just starting and they're like, I'm wanting to make sure that I am not marginalizing, that I'm making sure that they don't feel that they feel like they can say, hey, I don't feel like this is a good example of you feel like they have a voice to just right. pose a difference. Right. You know, just a different uh, perspective. We could have regular like check ins like, hey, we're just doing our check in for the week or for the month or something and say, where did we mess up? You want to approach it in a few ways. So there, there's several things that you want to have in place. One, um, you want to first hear about and And this is this is what makes, um, you know, uh, problem design so important to the world is that we know that um, if we're solving a problem for a a coffee house uh, in Texas or a um, a boutique in LA, that those experiences are going to be different. They might there might be the same core problem. Maybe the core problem is uh, people do not feel included in the business, but the experiences are different. So first, you got to kind of unpack what what people of color or marginalized groups are feeling in the business. Do they feel like they're included? And you have to do it in a way that is organic because oftentimes, and and we talked a little bit about this before, oftentimes for me as a black person, if you come to me and say, what are some issues we have with race? I'm going to collect all the past information I have about my experiences in this company and be like, are you trying to bait me into entering into a conversation and now you're going to demote me or you're going to prevent me from advancing or you're going to, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it's, it's delicate. And, um, but you know, if so bringing in an outside person is, is, is a good thing in that sense too. The other thing is you, what you need in place is you need the conversation to happen. You need to explore the problem. You need affinity groups, which we just talked about. If you're a large business, you can, um, have an affinity group started by a black leader there to mm-hmm. give black people space or Latino people space, Latinx people space to have conversations, L- people from the LGBTQ plus community to come together to have conversations. Um, and then you also need um, just a strategy on how you discuss those problems. It's always a red flag for me when businesses in their policies, in their branding, in their messaging have diversity, 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 diversity. I can tell that if the word racism is brought up, oh, well, we don't have those issues because we're diverse. You know what I mean? And so, um, you know, that's another factor. Uh, If you're a smaller business, you can't really have affinity groups because that kind of outs people and you know it it creates a a weird dynamic but you can provide space for those folks to hey do you want to we're going to invest in money for you to find affinity in in a professional organization you know what i mean yeah i so i really like that but could it also isn't it i would think it would also mean something to me i think if somebody said, Hey, I want to learn more about this. Um, I really value you. Do you, would you go with me to, to, um, or maybe they would feel pressured to do that. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to think like about, um, do you know what I mean? Like if I, if I wanted to learn about it too, 
I don't want them to be like, oh man, I got to go this thing with my boss or I got to go to this thing. with You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, but I'm trying to like, I'm trying to learn or say it's, it's my employee and I'm trying to learn and I, I want to show them that I care and that I value, I know that things are happening and that I might even be doing things that I'm not even trying to do, but it might really be hurting them or they're re, you know, it's a, my intention was not, but it it's because I don't know. We don't necessarily. You know, and this is a good, and you'll appreciate this, Diane, because you, you work at a university, you know, as a, as a professor, if a student comes to you and they're like, Hey, I don't know what to do with this homework. Your first question is going to be, well, what did you do? And if they didn't have the preparation or they didn't have a very specific question, it changes how that conversation happens. And so you don't want to enter into like learning from a black person without having done some work on your own. So Ibram Max Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of Michael, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, there's a lot of resources out there that you go to first mm. and then you come to your colleague your friend and say hey I, i'm reading this book right now by michael eric dyson and and he mentions this i don't know if i fully understand that and i know you've talked about uh race before or you know i noticed on on instagram that you're an advocate can you help me understand what what this specific piece means you know and so you, you kind of want to approach it in that way. Like you, you've done some deep reflection and thought on your own. And now you're ready to have that conversation. It can't just be like, Hey, now you're going right. to teach me. Right. 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 So Naomi says uh, businesses can also check their vendor list. Do you have any contractors or vendors mm. that are minority mm. owned mm. businesses? Are you, yeah. in, are you and employees reading business or other books by people of color? Are you yeah. diversifying your leadership? Are you listening to podcasts that have speakers that are people of color? Are These are all things uh, we as white majority people can do to start, um, gosh, I'm sorry, to start getting our heads and our hearts in the right spot. And then she also yeah. wrote things that also will show your non-majority staff that it matters to the leadership. So I think that that's a, yeah. a really important, important. Very important. So, so in this, and I just know there's some people in here that are like this. Um, so think of people who are like my first boyfriend was Japanese, right? So this, I didn't think anything of it, uh, but my grandmother didn't really like it because her husband had fought the Japanese in World War II, right? My grandfather. And so it, it wasn't the same for her as it was for me. And I didn't have that... Um, it just wasn't, you know, how different people are raised and where my grandmother was from and whatever. Mm. So when you have interracial um, families, there can be even more issues that come around when I, where I can imagine that this would be, um, is that, is that some of this also when you're, that, is also part of that cultural thing that we need to be sensitive to. And how can we be more sensitive to that? Cause even like people who adopt, uh, you know, say um, I have a lot of friends who have adopted kids from Guatemala or from China mm. or right. So mm. the family is um, has a, say it's an all white family, except that one kid. And then there's like huge, like they love, it doesn't matter. Right. That they, they are just love. That's their kid. But there, that kid's getting bullied, or you know, it, it just seems like that there can be other things that we need to be. You know, you you have to equip your kids to understand society hmm. and how society operates. Um, I just I've illustrated this this book that hmm. addresses, well, I haven't. I didn't illustrate it. A good friend of mine, uh, her company illustrated it. I wrote it. And so I'm going to start having come a lot more of these conversations with parents because I often get friends of mine who ask me for advice about how to have the race conversation with, with kids at an early age. 
because it's necessary if you are in an affluent area and you're the one black family or you've adopted a, a child that's not of your race or you're in an interracial relationship, race has to be an early conversation in the household because it will come up in society. It, oftentimes I, in workshops, I have people, we have this um, section called speak outs where we ask people to share a time where they've experienced um, discrimination as a result of you know, being a woman or being of a marginalized group or race. And uh, oftentimes people go back to the playground when they share stories. They wow. go back to a time where their friends told them that they couldn't play with them that day because they were that color or their friends made fun of them um, using um, stereotypes and, mm. and prejudicial remarks. Um, a teacher mistreated them. A lot of people will do speak outs on those types of things. And so it is very important because as a, as a child, one other thing is that you feel when you are mistreated, sometimes you feel guilty and you feel like it's your fault. You may never communicate it with your parents, but you're carrying that trauma with you all yeah. through life. Well, you probably don't tell it to your parents because you're ashamed. You feel like you did something mm -hmm. wrong. And then right. if you, we were shunned by those people, the teacher, the friends, then you mm -hmm. go home and then your parents will probably be like, well, what did you do? Right. Right. And you didn't do anything. Right. You just were. Right. And so we have to have, we have to have conversations about race early and, and that's critical when it comes to the societal change. Like, you know, a, a lot of my focus is on like changing very specific uh, businesses and organizations because, you know, racism is a, is a huge problem, but to solve the overall problem, you know, education in the home and ed the education system are huge, really, think, really big. I think that it's important to put that. I can't wait till your book comes out. So you'll have to fill me in on when that's going to be. I want to read Naomi's book. Uh, comment she said that can come up from from the minority side as well my father-in-law was very nervous when my husband told him told him that we were moving towards marriage um uh, you can be friends with white people he said but i suggest we don't join our families well naomi didn't no they 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 got married anyway so um and they have a great family and so i think that sometimes you just have to fight because it's more important to um know that but it is going to be a there's going, it's not like you do it once. It's going to be a continuous thing. And I think for kids, it's like, oh, I grew up a different way. And then um, that's, they always know this. They always, the, the mm -hmm. I think race has always had to be a part of that conversation because, right. and I, and maybe there's a real advantage to that because they understand. Right. And it's to equip them with the tools to recognize it when it's happening as well. Um, you know, my daughter's, we sat down and we watched this um, a mini documentary on YouTube about, you know, a prom in the South that was integrating. And this was in like the, the late 2010s and there's still proms that are not integrated. And um, to hear the people give the excuse of tradition and it's always been that way. And I don't think anybody has a problem with it. Um, as a mask for what is a racist practice um, and having that conversation with my daughters, um, those types of things are important. So I want to talk about this and I know we had talked about this a little bit, but this is in business and this is specifically in fashion when, so some, some things are happening internally in a company or how they're hiring models or things like that. Right. But then there's also, the employees that are working in a retail space, right? And then it's how mm -hmm. they treat certain customers. And, and right. I experienced that as a server, right? There would be other servers that would be like, oh my goodness, these rednecks or these whatever, mm -hmm. name a group of people, they were like terrible tippers, right? And I just didn't care. I just, I was like, I didn't count what people gave me after everything. I just tried to give good service, mm. but that was just me. And I think 
um, it was, I just had faith that God was going to provide at the end of the week when I, that was where I was getting my money from. Right. But, but some people would, would feed into that. And then it would be in the back of the house. They'd be like, Oh, you know, these people. And I always, um, would challenge that. It really, it, I just think that's a big lie, but this is happening even in, mm-hmm. I mean, it happens in, that's not retail, I guess it's food services, but this is happening even when somebody walks into, um, like if you were shopping for clothes and you went into a clothing store, yeah. what, what happens and how can we work on that part? So, um, I'll share some stories about what's happened to me. Okay. I've been followed around stores still to this day, get followed around stores. Um, I get the, the overly helpful sales associate (laughs) that's like, Oh, do you need anything? And asking me every five minutes, if I'm okay, if I'm finding everything, okay. I've been accused of taking things that I didn't take. And so I think what do you do in that situation? You know, it depends. Like the pain of racism is interesting. There's been times where I'm like, I'm going to buy the most expensive thing in here to prove to you. Like I get Mm. embarrassed and upset and I want to show you that, you know what I mean? Um, or um, I've just kind of like, oh, here we go again and just took it. And, you know, um, I've complained to managers, like every response you can think of, you go through because it happens so often and so frequently. Do you think it's you worse know, for and, black men than it is for black women? I Like, I don't want to speak to the pain. I feel like the pain is equal I mean, more, not, not about the pain, the amount of, like the, it happens more toward yeah. like. Statistically, yes, there's more of a criminalization of black men than of black women. And that, that goes to mm-hmm. implicit bias and the Harvard mm-hmm. study. And, mm-hmm. and so um, people just, and the, and the, the doll tests, people just automatically associate black with a bunch of stereotypes. Mm. Uh, oh yeah, the thirteenth. Yeah, amazing. We oh, let's not even talk about the prison industrial complex. But yeah, in in retail and in service industries, there's implicit bias at play. When you bring people into a space to discuss race, they discover a lot of things and a lot of behaviors that they've been party to that they never thought of. They never thought of why are they questioning this black man. Right. They never thought of like what's been fed to them in media, what what's been Mm. fed to them by their family. And they never look at the facts because the fact is I've had people in workshops say I have really good black friends, but I'm also I've been very prejudiced toward black people. And I look at them as an exception and I don't look at them as like people. So I'm at the same time that I'm being prejudiced and biased toward black people, I'm also stripping my friends of their black identities mm-hmm. because they're different. It's not oh, them, right. but most of black people are X. Hmm. So how does a company, so you as a consumer, you go and there, you have done all the different things. If you go to the manager or you even write a letter to corporate, what do they say? What do they do? What What is an outcome? And then how do some companies try and change? Or is this just, it's like, because it's so huge of a company, they just are like, oh, that's one person. Uh, I've gotten different responses. I've gotten the gift, the gift card. I've gotten, um, you know, the fill out this form. But like, they're not the- saying, hey, we're working on this. We realize this. We're going to put this in as something that we're not often, not often. I think when, when you go, if you go on to like major retail spaces and you look at their employee handbook or their, their stuff on um, loss prevention and, and diversity, they, they hardly ever mention racism. They hardly ever mention profiling. 
They mentioned diversity a lot. They mentioned the legal aspects of it, which are required by law of not discriminating against people because of race, uh, origin, you know. But it's not like they have somebody that comes around. Like I remember when I worked in retail, we had like a regional manager and the regional manager would come and make sure we were doing our job and making sure the sets were done correctly. So they care about how their jeans are folded, but they're not caring about what I was doing to a customer or how I was treating a customer. Really, that could be another level that they could bring into that and say, hey, I was just watching. Why did you do that to that black man why did you and that gets into when our bias kind of comes into play right so if i'm an employee at a retail location and demi i'll send you some studies demi asks, does the data control have control sets for example how often this might happen to a white person and racially homogenous i'll send you a really really good study on on the retail aspects at at a drugstore um but uh your question so our our bias tends to come out when like if i'm a an employee for a major uh department store the the training you can go on glassdoor and read about the training and we probably all experience being in retail or food service and that training that's on the computer and you know answering survey questions that are obvious and so i've had that training and then you're, you're asking me for two things. You're saying sell credit cards and make sure people don't steal. Mm. So now since I haven't been trained properly on how to sell credit cards or how to make sure people don't steal, I'm gonna, I have to go back to my own experience of the world, media, what I see in movies. And now I have to figure out like, how am I gonna prevent people from stealing? from stealing oh people that still look a certain way Mm. or they dress a certain way right or they dress a certain way yeah Hmm. yeah i've i've been uh the i got some funny stories but i remember um you know uh back in the days when we used to go uh clubbing in austin uh i remember we we all get dressed up you know and I, I want to say like three out of five of us were wearing Jordans. Went to this to this bar. Mind you, they're playing a song that is literally about Jordans and told us you, you can't come in. You can't wear those shoes in here. Appropriation, right? So you can take our music and you can have people all in there celebrating it but you're going to prevent us from being ourselves in this establishment where you're playing music that is talking about what we're wearing. That's crazy. Yeah. So Naomi wants me to tell you to put the, send me those notes too, so I can put them in the show notes that whatever you're going to say. Oh, uh, the studies that I was talking to Demi mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we are almost at the end. We have a minute left. Yeah. We still didn't get through anything, but we did much better. We did much better, I think. Maybe. Do you think we yeah. covered a little bit more? Um, I think for me, I would also love to know if, um, so some of those books that you had, if, I think you said like three or four books. If you could send me those two, I can put them in the show notes also so that people can start doing some of their own research and then maybe um in a another couple months we'll have you back on to finish this or continue it because i don't think we'll ever finish right because it's something we're always working on um or something hopefully we're working on but i want people to know this is like in if this was a business and they were retail or in fashion or something like that this would be great for you. This is kind of what you do. You can go in as a consultant and and listen, do a lot of listening internally, and then then bring up some of these things that they could do that uh, or they might be doing that they really should be um, watching out for because it's not um, it's not the way it should be. You shouldn't be harassed in a right. store. 
I have two hands. I can steal just as easy as you can steal, right? And nobody knows if it, I'm stealing or if you're stealing, right? I'm right. pretty much sure neither of us are stealing, right? But it just has to do um, with biases. And I think that if right. we even we bring some of these up in um, what we're, to me at the university, there's this, um, I, I don't have it. I don't see it. it. It's like the, you know, wear a mask. And it's just, a, I, you know, a, a, it's like, um, it's just a black outline or gray or whatever. Right. But it's clearly to white people. <laughs> yeah, the, the silhouette. Yeah, the silhouette. I'm like, I'm going to make yeah. it. And so I've been working on it because I just think that um, it it's just simple. It's a simple thing that could be easily changed. But right now, it's just white people. And right. I just, I'm right. like, I think that that could be something that you can either make it more general. So it's just a head shape, right? But when you include hair or you include the hairline, it is just different. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, right. so I worked on it last fall because it really pissed me off. I'm like, I love it's it. subtle. It's super subtle, yeah. right? But that's yeah. design. What that says to me is that and maybe the university obviously isn't um, trying to say this. I would hope not. But they're like, oh, well, the white people are important. We need to keep them safe. Right. Or maybe that's not. But that's <laughs> right, that right, is right. sort of what it feels like. But our campus is um, we have a vi very diverse campus and we have lots of African-American students. And so to me, it's like. Uh, one of my alumni, I was like, can you look at this? Cause I feel comfortable asking. I'm like, I want to make, I'm trying to do um, one that is not, I don't want it to be, Oh, there's one black person. And, and, and here's the, here's the black, you know, hanging sign. Right. And then here's the right. white hanging right. sign. Like I didn't want right. that. I just wanted one of those people to be representing black and one uh, can represent whatever. Right. right? Often, oftentimes, the solutions that that I produce with folks, um, you, you know, in the design thinking process, the last step is implementation. So what I do is we add um, a step of dialogue because sometimes you you come up with a solution. And then let's have a dialogue about about imagery and race mm. on the campus. Like, where do we where do we see things that perpetuate racism in in visual imagery? And so, like, creating solutions because part of it is you know you have to have transparency, you have to have recovery because you could do your best and your due diligence, and then somebody could still be hurt. So let's have open conversations about it so that that improvement and the iteration on it gets mm. better. I love that. So including people in the iteration before it's the final, instead of just saying, hey, we solved it. We included, you know. We no, well, doing that, but then also after admitting that we know this is probably not perfect. Mm. So let's let's have a conversation about this larger issue. So something else that I, I'll just um, and I, I see Van wants next time he she wants us to include um, wants to hear more from Will. Clearly, I talk too much today. I'm just kidding. Van. <laughs> um, about she wants to hear more from you about allyship, what it is and what is not. I know Van's mm -hmm. not saying that I yeah. talk too much. Yeah, that's said, my quote. Ha -ha. Yeah, I know she is. But so I want to know what that is. So I wrote that really big at the top. So we'll make sure that we cover that. But I want to tell you this. So one of the, so I have, um, I'd say probably in a class of maybe 20, there's three or four African American students. I'm not, uh, there's other minorities in there, but let's just say there's four African American students. And I will see, and I have to get onto everybody actually, because I, so when we're doing a website or we're doing whatever, um, I'm like, hey, why are all these people white on your, can I, I mean, there aren't as many, clearly. Um, that's definitely a need in, I believe, in stock photography or in things like that. We need to have something else that we can um, do, uh, use imagery. But I think it's really important um, to notice that um, even the African-American students are just finding white people in, um, mm -hmm. in, 
in, in just using that. And I said, it's, I, it's not just for the African-American students to find um, black people, yeah, yeah, I, right? It needs yeah. to be everybody. It needs, to, we need Asians. We need old, we need young, we need men, we need women. We need, we, we need to have, and I think that we see it. And I've had some conversations with some of these students and some of them are like, thank you for saying that because I didn't, you know, I notice it, but I don't feel like I can do this. And so now that I'm calling out everybody, but I, I'm like, we all need to make sure people are represented. And I think that there's, there's definitely a need for people, photographers that are, uh, I mean, that are shooting people who, you know, we need right. more diversity in stock photography for sure. There's a huge market open. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Anyway, I want to make sure everybody knows um, yeah. where they can go to uh, learn more. You can go to willgo.io, and that is the best way to get in touch with Will. Yep. You can also go to instagram.com slash willgoio, and I'm going to put these in the – they will be underneath, and they will also be in um, – uh, if you're watching on YouTube or they'll be wherever you get your podcast in the about. Yeah, let's, let's have some conversations over there. And you've been on clubhouse a lot. So are you yeah. doing anything there? Is there anything? I'll be, I'll be on this weekend, uh, probably on Sunday. Yeah. So I'll send you, I'll send you some information about that too. I, it's probably going to be a conversation around uh, prototyping. Cause that's mm -hmm. my favorite, favorite, favorite part of design, but it's also the most neglected. Mm um so yeah if y'all want to join that for sure awesome and are you will go um on class i have you... no idea that i'm thinking right now i <laughs> don't know <laughs> well we can probably search will hardaway or william yeah. hardaway right uh i'll i'll send you i'll send you a link <laughs> that, okay. that'll make it easier okay that would be great well yeah. um will thank you so much for doing this with me and thank you for yeah. letting me learn with you and you guys if you want to see the show notes as soon as will gives them to me i'll put them underneath and it'll be at recharging you.com slash three six nine and then we'll have will back on and continue this conversation and i hope you guys make sure you go and follow willgo.io on instagram and then you can go to willgo.io and see what he's doing and see if maybe your company should hire will to come and uh, talk that or about that or see where he is online and see what he's doing so that we can learn more about about the stuff and be better so all thank right you, thank you